I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Todd Deshida. And I'm Thomas Mills. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. So although a lot of podcasts have sponsors or ad revenue, we here at Climate Optimus rely on listener donations to bring you the programming you hear. And given that, if you're a regular listener and you value what you get from us, consider a donation that aligns with that value. All you have to do is head over to our website, climateoptimist.co, and click the donate button. And, you know, the reality is even a $5 a month donation goes a long way for us in terms of delivering, you know, the content that we bring. And, you know, while you're at the website, also don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. We're now doing monthly installments and there's lots of, you know, cool facts on climate solutions, perspective on climate news, and, and as always, you know, tips on, on how to make a difference. So when the Inflation Reduction Act passed this last year, it really was a huge accomplishment and, you know, represented the first major climate legislation that was passed in the United States and helped us, you know, get a lot closer to achieving the 52% cut in emissions that we need to by 2030. But now as we, you know, begin with a, a divided Congress, it begs the question, where should we be focusing our efforts? You know, Republicans have continued to be reluctant to support any climate legislation. And so, you know, even though we're making progress on cutting carbon, we still have a gap to close. So in today's episode, we're exploring the different ways that the U.S. can reach its emission targets and, you know, at the same time, ideally help the rest of the world meet theirs. But before we go there, Thomas, you got a reason for hope for us? Yeah, sure, Jason. So Exxon Mobil has announced that it's going to stop its routine gas flaring in the Permian oil basin, which is a big oil basin in the southwest of the US. Admittedly, this is going to be a sort of a, uh, a stepped drawdown and final flaring will continue until 2030, <laughs> which seems like a, a, a little too little too late. Um, and it feels that we're sort of congratulating the uh, the kid that's finally decided to hand his homework in uh, on time for once. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely coming late. It's good to see it's happening. Maybe more so just because it puts pressure on the other oil players to do the same. So our our guest today to you know help us explore where we should be focusing our our you know climate advocacy energy is Dr. John Foley, the executive director at Project Drawdown. John is a renowned climate and environmental scientist, writer, and speaker. His work focuses on finding solutions to sustain the climate, ecosystems, and, and natural resources that we all depend on. He's published over 140 scientific articles, many cited in you know Nature and Science, and has appeared on a wealth of media outlets, everything from the, the BBC to NPR to the New York Times. John earned his uh, PhD from the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at the University of Wisconsin. Good, uh, good badger. In his spare time, he enjoys nature photography, hiking, kayaking, and exploring new places. All the good things that that the outdoors have to offer. And we're stoked to have him on the on the program today. John, welcome to Climate Optimus. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me here today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Well, let's start you off with a, a basic question. When it comes to efforts to address climate change, what makes you hopeful? Well, gosh, you know, that's a, that's a great question because there's so much negative news out there about climate change and all of that's real. There are definitely mounting problems uh, of global temperatures continuing to rise, more destabilized weather patterns, more impacts more kind of dragging our heels on climate change. So there's plenty on the bad news side of the ledger. But the thing that we often miss in our media conversations um, all too often is that there's actually a lot of good news too. One th whole thread of good news is the technologies that we need to address climate change are largely here now. Uh, most of the things we need to do to address climate change are available today. And most of them are getting more cost-effective and more viable all the time. So we have a lot of solutions. They're abundant. Most of them work. And most of them make us money if we use them wisely. And they can solve other problems while we're at it. 
So that's the good news. And what makes me hopeful about that on top of just the changes in technology and markets and the economics of this is uh, we're finally shifting the conversation away from debating whether climate change is real to now right. uh, debating how we're going to solve it. That's good. And I've been working on climate change for 30 years, and I've actually never been more hopeful about the problem than now. Because not only, again, are we getting more solutions every day and more energy around them, so to speak. The other good news is that the, there are underlying trends that are actually moving in the right direction. A lot of things that uh, we can talk about more of this later, but about 30 to 40 countries in the world, including the United States, have been cutting their emissions pretty dramatically over the last decade or two. And other countries are joining with us. So we're starting to see a little bit of movement in the right direction. And maybe we're just beginning to steer the Titanic away from the iceberg. Maybe not completely, but we're not <laughs> going to hit it dead on anymore. And so right. the worst of the worst case scenarios seem to be out the window. But now, you know, how, how quickly can we turn things into a better direction is really the question. Well, it's good to hear. And I think your, your point about the dialogue shifting is a good one, right? That, you know, we're, we're focused on the productive stuff now. And, and, you know, a debate of the solutions is a lot better about whether the problem exists in the first place. Admittedly, the debates about which solution is the right one can get a little fraud and a little nasty sometimes. And that's silly. But at least, you know, we're focusing on the right things. Now, it's admittedly 20 to 30 years later than I would have liked it. But we're here now, and um, we didn't avoid all the problems of climate change, but we can still avoid the worst of it. I'm a glass is half full kind of guy, and I think there's a glass half full here, and we might have the opportunity to fill it up a little more if we put our minds to it. I, I like the analogy. Well, let's uh, let's turn to Project Drawdown and your work there. Wondering if you just can kind of explain um, what the organization does and kind of how you found your way into your current role. Yeah. Well, thanks um, for asking about that. Yeah, Project Drawdown is a uh, it's a nonprofit. We're based in the United States. Um, we're about twenty to thirty people, mostly scientists and communicators and analysts and folks like that. And we have a single purpose. Our purpose is to be a resource to the world on climate solutions, because uh, now that we're talking about solutions, we're debating them, we're arguing about them, we're trying to get money for this one or that one, we're trying to get bills passed, we're trying to get companies to do stuff. Somebody needs to be kind of the traffic cop or the uh, consumer reports, maybe. Somebody needs to be the honest broker about climate solutions. That is, you know, which are truly viable and effective solutions? How big could that right. solution be? How much is that solution really going to cost? And how long will it take before it's real? We've done a lot of work of building what we call now a, a, um, a solutions library for climate solutions. If you go to our website, drawdown.org, you'll find a huge, um, about 100 different solutions worth of um, library of climate solutions, where we've investigated very, very deeply what we think are the most viable, effective, and um, promising solutions to climate change that are out there. Uh, so I'm really, really proud to work for Project Drawdown, um, and I've been with the organization about four years. So um, that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm actually a climate scientist by training. I was a university professor for many years at the University of Wisconsin and the University of Minnesota, where I led a couple of big research institutes and centers focusing on big environmental issues around climate change, but also the food system and things like deforestation and problems like that. And then for a few years, I was the head of something called the California Academy of Sciences, which is the big science museum in San Francisco. It's a uh, kind of big uh, green museum, aquarium, and uh, planetarium in Golden Gate Park. And my job was to help the museum kind of pivot to being focused more on the future and more about sustainability of life on Earth. And that was really exciting. And now for the last few years, I've been at Project Drawdown, taking what was a, a really cool book project and morphing it into a standing nonprofit act as a resource to the world around climate solutions. Yeah. And I'll say as somebody who's who's been to your library, it is, it is pretty fantastic and recommend folks go and check it out because there is a you know, if you want to geek out on climate solutions, there's there's ample there to do so. Well, one thing I'm really proud of um, is we also provide a lot of educational resources too. Like one uh, suite of resources I really like is something we did called Climate Solutions 101, which is a like a kind of a mini course, uh, like a master class, if you will, on climate solutions science. They're you know 15 minutes long. There are only six of them. You could do you know, watch one while you're on your uh, Stairmaster or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know um, 
so we're hoping those will be helpful to the world too. We've, we've had about 100,000 people go through that course already, and I uh, uh, would love to have some more. Well, we'll definitely link it uh, with this episode on our, on our website. Well, let's uh, pivot to kind of our main topic. Start with kind of the question of, you know, how much is the Inflation Reduction Act, which folks were rightly excited about, how much is it projected to lower U.S. emissions by 2030? Yeah, well, let's first step back and put this in context. One of the things a lot of people don't know is the U.S. was already cutting its emissions. Our, the United States peaked its emissions in the year 2007. That's the highest they ever were, and they've been falling basically ever since. And as I mentioned before, about 30 or 40 other countries are as well, including the UK, most European countries, uh, Japan, a few others, mostly Western capitalist democracies. Interestingly, the more capitalist you are, the more you've cut your emissions, it seems, uh, which is kind of <laughs> ironic. Um, but this might be an artifact of you know moving on from bad energy sources like coal to other things or being more efficient or having economic development. But also the fact renewables got a lot cheaper in the last 20 years, as has energy technologies like LED lighting and energy efficiency measures. So things, batteries have gotten cheaper, LED lighting's getting cheaper, solar. So a lot of things were already happening. And so the U.S. already cut its emissions by 20%. We need to cut them a lot more. And the Inflation Reduction Act will help. But we were already projected, depending whose estimates you look at, to cut our emissions down to about 30% below their peak by the end of this decade anyway. So we're at 20, we're headed towards 30. The Inflation Reduction Act will take us probably conservatively to at least 40%, going another 10% beyond that, maybe even more than that. The other thing that's pretty exciting is the Inflation Reduction Act, while it's a lot of money, um, will spend about $36 billion a year for 10 years on mostly things that could help with climate change. But that's not the whole story. Uh, venture capital alone, just here in the U.S., is spending about 60 to 70 billion a year right now on climate tech. That's double what the U.S. government's spending, and uh, that's done without Congress. That's done without a mandate. That's just stuff that's happening in the private sector, and that number could grow by leaps and bounds in the future if we play our cards right. So I think there's kind of a confluence of a lot of good things happening at the same time. One, we are already cutting our emissions. Two, we had um, other kind of investments happening, making technologies and businesses more climate friendly all the time. Now the government's stepping in and putting their chips on the table, which is really helpful, especially a lot of the ways the IRA is working. And that might further even more private investment and more change. And so I'm starting to see maybe the potential for a little bit of snowballing here. And uh, right. that could be really exciting. Well, it's, it's exciting to hear you talk about the, you know, the positive trajectory that you know, we were already on the fact that the mm -hmm. Inflation Reduction Act is maybe not even just additive, but could have some, you know, snowballing effects in terms of turning that yeah. up. And so that we really then, you know, it's about how do we squeeze out some more reductions to get to that, you know, 50% that, that obviously climate scientists tell us is, is critical. So I guess with that forward look in mind, what, what climate solutions do you see as sort of the best opportunities to kind of close that gap? Well, absolutely. If you look at where the Inflation Reduction Act is putting its money, I'm impressed by some things um, very, very much and others uh, not so much. That could be a lot better. <laughs> and so I'll just say those are opportunities to do even better later. But right now it's focused very heavily on renewable electricity, the electricity sector being you know, about a third of U.S. emissions. Uh, it's also incentives to do um, interesting things around energy storage, which we do have to solve some of this to make the grids more reliable, more flexible and easier to accommodate growing renewables. That's that's excellent. All good stuff. I'm also impressed by the IRA's focus on um, things like heating and cooling, like uh, heat pumps as a drop-in replacement for furnaces and air conditioners. So you don't even need natural gas anymore. You can run you know, entire buildings off of renewable power from you know heating in the winter and then cooling in the summer with the same device. Heat pumps are magical. They're wonderful, amazing things. <laughs> and finally, Americans are discovering them. This is great. And now we're getting tax rebates for this. Uh, electric vehicles, too, will take off. Um, it's interesting in other countries um, that are ahead of us, especially Norway, which is the leading the world in electric vehicle sales. Once countries hit about 5% of vehicle sales being electric or at least plug-in hybrid electric, something kind of changes where you start to see more and more electric vehicles everywhere. You hit kind of an inflection point, a tipping point. We've got a ways to get there, but the U.S. will be hitting that pretty soon, and that could be very exciting as well. Uh, but we definitely need more work on charging infrastructure. We need a hell of a lot more electric vehicles. 
The area where I think the Inflation Reduction Act, though, kind of blows it is in agriculture. They're doing very little there. And that's about 10% of the U.S. emissions. Globally, agriculture and land use is more like 25% of our emissions. But in the U.S., we, we copped out. We kind of gave in to the special interest in, around agriculture. We didn't talk about the fundamentals, which is, you know, we eat too much beef. And most, yeah. almost all of that beef is bad for the environment. Very little of this is truly like regenerative beef, much less than 1%. And so 99 plus something percent of our beef is a huge methane and greenhouse gas emitter. And we also waste about 30 to 40 percent of all the U.S. food supply. These are the two big levers to address emissions in agriculture are changing our diets and reducing food waste. Not one word about that stuff in the IRA. Instead, we give credits, voluntary credits to farmers to maybe farm more uh, kind of carbon farming techniques that could put carbon back in the soil which is great. Right. We love that stuff at Project Drawdown, but uh, that's a secondary solution. First, you cut your emissions. Second, you put it, you know, you clean up the emissions you already put out there. It's like if your bathtub's overflowing, the first thing you do is you turn off the spot, you know, the, the spigot, then you go find a mop. So uh, I'm not that impressed with that as a single kind of approach. We need to do a lot better in agriculture. I think we also need to do better in industrial emissions. We also need to focus U.S. power beyond our borders. This is, um, imagine, remember we were calling this originally something like a Green New Deal? Well, that was never going to fly. But some right. called the Inflation Reduction Act did finally. But what we really also need is kind of a Green Marshall Plan because the U.S. is only about 11% of the world's emissions today and falling. Um, that's really interesting. And yet our economic and cultural and technological influence, especially in our political influence, extends far beyond the 11% of our emissions. So yes, we should take care of our own emissions, but what can we do to export American ingenuity, know-how, and technologies to countries that still emit a lot of carbon? Uh, the ones that are projected to emit even more, like India. Uh, and finally, the thing I like about the Inflation Reduction Act is, well, it passed. <laughs> it didn't cost right. Democrats any votes. Uh, in fact, it might have helped them with a, this a little bit because it was put in kitchen table terms. It wasn't abstract. It wasn't about saving polar bears. You know, environmentalists, have to remember that only 2% of Americans list the environment as a top issue facing the country. And uh, so I'm pretty excited about the reframing too, to like, let's be grounded and remind ourselves environmentalists are a very poor sample of what Americans think. And uh, when you talk, when you meet people where they are, as opposed to where you want them to be, somehow it works better. <laughs> and so sure. I, I like that the framing of the Inflation Reduction Act also taught us as a community, maybe how to get stuff done in Washington for the first time in 30 years is talk about kitchen table issues that everybody can get behind. And it worked. So without, obviously, you know, there's a lot of complexities associated with policy, but thinking about the the buckets you talked about where we still have a lot of opportunity, you know, agriculture, you know, industry, and then, you know, helping put in place policies that help our, you know, neighbors reduce their emissions. Mm -hmm. What might that look like? In other words, are there specific things that, you know, we should be pushing our elected officials to to embrace in this, you know, latest Congress. You know, do we, you know, push for stuff at a state level? What sort of things, you know, help us realize those emission reductions that you're talking about? Well, I'm not a politician, but I think, you know, anybody who reads a paper or a website these days knows the next Congress is going to get absolutely nothing done. And that's by design. So the House is going to spend its time investigating Biden and trying to you know, hurt him politically before he runs for office and all this kind of nonsense. We're back to this BS of nobody's going to get anything done because we're too busy getting people reelected or not elected um, instead of doing the job they were sent to Washington to do, which is actually govern. So politics is going to fail us for the next two years. I, I, I can't see any really constructive legislative action now for the next uh, biennium. But uh, the Biden administration could do a number of things without Congress right now. The power of the purse. I mean, the Pentagon is still the single biggest procurer of resources in the world. So, you know, through procurement, what the government buys itself is a very powerful economic signal and can help kind of incentivize new technologies, new solutions, new things. Improving standards, improving um, kind of the rules and regulations the White House can do without congressional approval all helps a lot. Um, Obama was a master of this too. This is how he got a lot of things done without, with a very hostile Congress on climate issues. Biden can, you know, 
pull from that playbook and get a lot of things done through uh, through earmarks, you know, through um, kind of um, budget lines for procurement, through rules and regulations and so on, and sometimes by executive order. But it's certainly in diplomacy. Um, we have to be smarter than this. We can't just... I never understood why we use the UN to try to do climate work because, you know, it's trying to get 200 unruly countries to agree. And if any one of them doesn't, then the whole deal's off, right? Totally. That isn't going to get us the progress we need fast enough. So what can we do with a couple of countries? For example, on uh, deforestation. Deforestation today emits more greenhouse gases than the entire United States. It's about 12% of global emissions. The U.S. is 11. Well, guess what? Brazil and Indonesia emit about half of that. Uh, just two countries, most of that for beef, for animal feed, and for palm oil. So let's focus on those things. How do we do um, exert diplomatic pressure or help Lula, the new president of Brazil, kind of stop deforestation in Brazil? What can we do to incentivize better relationships with Brazil if they stop deforestation or tell them if they don't, they're not going to get the trade regu- you know, rules they want with the U.S.? Or, you know, let's, let's not work with 200 countries. Let's focus on a couple where we can move the needle. What are the 80-20 rules? in diplomacy to get climate action. How can we do that on refrigerants? How can we do that on methane? Let's get really granular and really strategic. Can we get a deal on methane with China and Saudi Arabia and a couple other countries that maybe want something from us? We don't need to solve every problem. We just need to solve um, as many problems as we can when they're in front of us. Let's not make the, the best the enemy of the good. Let's get stuff done. Uh, that's what Biden can do in the next two years. I, I just don't think Congress is going to be a real partner here. They're just going to be busy showboating for uh, TV for the next four, two years. So, so given that, where if you're somebody who is you know passionate about you know us achieving the the emission reductions that we need to, where should you be focusing your efforts? Where would you recommend you know individuals, our listeners, be putting their efforts to help this momentum that we have, you know, accelerate? Well, it depends on the listener, right? Um, we have a saying at Project Drawdown, we say every job is a climate job, um, but every job is different. So every listener is different. Everybody's going to bring a different tool to the table. Um, we continue to need, though, you know, political activism, certainly, but I would also be looking at cities and states. I'd be looking at the less sexy stuff like uh, public utility commissions, zoning boards, because a lot of the projects on the ground get held up by approval processes. There's an awful lot of backlash in rural parts of the country about not installing wind or solar farms or transmission lines. This kind of NIMBY in not in my backyard kind of thing also happens not just in rural areas, but in urban areas as well. And so we need to kind of work on the ground on the kind of less sexy stuff than Washington, D.C., but where the governing actually happens. That's where I'd put a lot of the activism is like boots on the ground. Don't throw soup at paintings, that kind of stuff. Go out and talk to public utility commissioners. Go talk to zoning boards. Talk about jobs. Talk about clean air. Talk about health. Talk about security. Talk about economic development for rural America. Things like that. Win over friends because we're going to need them to build out the world we're going to build here. So that's where I'd put the activism bucket. So I think that's important. And then if people who are in the media and storytelling, um, journalism, writers, artists, uh, people like this, we desperately need you too. Because uh, right now, the, the dominant story is climate change is bad, and we're all screwed, and there's nothing we can do. That's where 99% of American media coverage is right now. Less than 1% of media coverage in America today is focusing on the solutions and the yeah. amazing people who are doing that hard work. Let's have a little more, please. Could we have 20%, maybe 40 maybe 50 would be great, you know, whatever. But a hell of a lot more talking about the heroines, the heroes, the people you've never heard of the people who really deserve some attention, who are doing amazing work in a community somewhere to address climate change and address jobs, um, reduce childhood asthma, improve uh, equity and justice in their communities. There's so many great uplifting stories to be told. Let's tell more of them. Well, thanks for that. And and here at Climate Optimist, we definitely couldn't agree more on the on the media side of things. There's way too little focus on the solutions and the things that we need to do and, and sort of this continued churning on, on the problem. Well, and not only just focus on the problem, the anger and anxiety and, you know, when the word climate anxiety becomes a you know, term in the Oxford English Dictionary now, it's like, what? What the hell is that? Um, you know, we've we've swung from like, working so much on getting awareness of climate change. Now we've scared people so much they're anxious and disengaged. That um, This is so bizarre. 
Over 90% of Americans believe climate change is real. Over 60% say they're alarmed or concerned about it. And then kind of, I would read as anxious and worried about climate change. Sure. But the disconnect is now only 2% of Americans say it's a top issue that faces them. So we're aware of the problem. We're worried about the problem, but we're not that engaged. And we don't think it's a top issue. We've kind of given up on it. Wow. Did we screw up or what? So we managed to scare a lot of people, but we didn't empower people or inspire them. How about instead, you know, talking about what we can do together and that there are opportunities and some people are trying really hard to pull them off. Um, That isn't naive optimism. That's just truth. There's an incredible opportunity here to stop climate change and build a better world while we're at it. Let's talk about that and let's get to, you know, the real work instead of, you know, let's all fight each other in a big mud wrestling match outside of D.C. That's not serving us very well. Yeah, it turns out pessimism doesn't really generate a lot of uh, productivity. Yeah, well, well, pessimists are often right about their own future. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, optimists at least have the conditional possibility of being right about theirs. Not guaranteed, but at least there's a chance. And um, I think there's a, a case for optimism here that, you know, the Americans and the world has often done its best work when our backs are against the wall and when we're challenged to be our best. Maybe I'm corny, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I think that's when we've been at our best as a people, is when we, we kind of take that higher calling. And wow, if there was one more compelling call for action than climate change, to you know leave a good world for future generations, at least as good as the one we inherited from the people before us, I don't know what is. You know, that, I think that's, that's the most inspiring thing people could ever be part of. Um, and we can. Uh, so let's do it. Well, John, thanks for joining us on the show, providing us a, a sense of where we are, the positives about the trajectory we're on, and yeah, and, and you know, helping make the case for you know a different vision of what our future can be, and helping us move past this this stuck point. Well, great. Well, thanks, Jason, and thank you for uh, your show, and uh, thanks for having me on today, and uh, and also keeping up the good work of uh, you know amplifying this notion that hey, there are some things to be hopeful and optimistic about out there in the, all the gloom, and the world is always been in that balance between, you know, what was it, the the worst of times and the best of times, according to Dickens. Um, We always lived in that world. So let's try to make it better and uh, emphasize what's going well and how we can make that accelerate and go even better into the future. So thanks for having me. So gents, what were your uh, takeaways and, you know, insights from the interview with John? Well, I guess I'll jump in here. He, you know, obviously it was very focused on the positive and, you know, solutions, which is good considering the name of our show and that our show is not <laughs> called Climate <laughs> Pessimist. So, you know, that kind of fit. I thought it was interesting that when he said that the capitalist countries are, are really doing a lot better at uh, scaling back on emissions, which that I was think an kind interesting of, point. Yeah, which I kind of thought shows that, you know, the market must be doing its thing and it must be, you know, economically feasible to implement climate, you know, friendly solutions to to our problems. You know, the other thing, too, that I thought was was very pertinent was what what John said about the media and the, the focus so much on the negative and that people seem to be worried and have a lot of anxiety, but they don't feel empowered or, you know, they don't feel empowered to do anything about it, and they, they feel hopeless. So I thought that was very on point. Well, it sort of validates the work we're trying to do here, right? And and I'm sure they're trying to do a Project Drawdown. Yeah. Thomas, uh, what, were your, what were your takeaways? Yeah, to follow on that last point you guys make, I, um, I, I really think that his point about not waiting for the UN to you know, get everybody in agreement and just focusing on developing those agreements with countries that can help you achieve what you need to achieve is a really good move. And that same thing at a Mm. personal level, don't fret the stuff that you can't do, just do what you can do at this stage. And I've been watching these border adjustment mechanisms be developed over the last, well, couple of decades now. And I think as a good news story, um, it looks like the European Union have finally agreed on a border adjustment mechanism for goods imported into the EU. And I think that's just a fantastic start. And they've gone after some of the highest emitting uh, 
imports first and foremost, such as cement, steel, aluminium, electricity, and hydrogen, because the bulk of the hydrogen produced globally is still made using fossil fuels. But that's you know one of those things where, you know, okay, so sure, we can't get the UN to agree on everything, but these border adjustment mechanisms are great because it means the EU has full control over something like that. And hopefully we see the US and Australia and other countries roll out similar mechanisms. But mm-hmm. I also am in agreement with him that not all carbon offsets in the ag sector are created equally. And I do question the permanency um, of some of these carbon offsets and the fact that here we are like paying farmers to do carbon offsets and things. But at the same time, we've left that spigot on full bore and we're still sucking those fossil fuels out of the ground as fast as we can go. That needs to come to an end. It's like the situation here in Australia where the government's you know, running around saying, oh, we've got all these like climate targets and they're really aggressive and that's great, but they just approved the bar- uh, fertilizer plant in Western Australia that makes urea fertilizer out of fossil fuels that could be extracted from the air, the nitrogen extracted from the air, um, utilizing you know, plants that are in existence already if we just changed our farming processes a little. Um, so it's a bit disappointing, but at the same time, I, I think it's something that if we can keep bringing this to the attention of the public, that hopefully things will get done about it. And it better still put a price on carbon because all of a sudden nobody would be buying urea fertilizer anymore. Yeah, I'm with you on putting a price on carbon. I mean, it's it's the easiest way to sort of pass it through the economy. And yeah, I mean, we're going to have to do some offsetting of emissions to you know, to bring us back down to safe levels of CO2, you know, but, but we need to reduce first. It's reduce first, then offset. It's not offset to buy time. So yeah, yeah completely agree with you there. And, you know, I thought John did a nice job of kind of highlighting different areas that we can focus in, given the fact that we have this divided Congress. And, you know, we, the beauty is there's stuff that, that at a state level that can be done, you know, we could be ramping up electric vehicle incentives. Some states have some great ones that are in place, but there's a lot of states that don't. You know, Utah, for instance, has an incentive in place for, you know, for heavy duty trucks, but they don't have anything in place for light passenger vehicles. So you add the light passenger vehicle piece, you know, that's making a big difference. And, you know, I I liked his point about partnerships and, you know, there's the Biden administration coming out of the last climate conference in November was touting a partner partnership agreement they made kind of with Egypt where they're helping Egypt develop 10 gigawatts of renewable energy, which is say that's a lot, while decommissioning about five gigawatts of, of natural gas. And I don't know if you guys have other thoughts on sort of specific examples of things that could be done, you know, in hopefully in 2023 or, you know, 2024. Well, we may, we already talked about this a little bit, but one of the things that Biden could, the administration could do would be to, you know, require all vehicles sold after 2035 to be zero emission. Some states are already doing this. California has done it. Oregon, um, Biden has ordered this uh, for the federal government to happen by 2027. Interestingly enough, I don't know if you guys heard about Wyoming. So they have actually gone the other direction. Yeah. And they're putting a measure in place to basically ban the sale of electric vehicles by 2035 or 2030. Yeah, 2035, saying the move will help safeguard the oil and gas industries. So (laughs) I think they're obviously trying to send a message here. Um, That they're going to go down swinging? Yeah, the last clause of the bill instructs Wyoming's Secretary of State to send a copy of the bill to the California governor who has backed (laughs) his state's ban on gas-powered vehicles throughout his governorship. I can just see how that goes when a staffer like lays that on the governor's desk of California and they said, sir, Wyoming told us to send this to you. And he'd be like, who? And they're like, Wyoming, (laughs) sir. And he's like, oh, well, good for them. And they're like, yeah, about 64 people live there. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's very sort of cynical. I mean, it's the stuff that John was talking about, the wasted energy Well, and I think somebody already mentioned, too, about creating a low-carbon product standard for cement and steel. 
Biden has an executive order in place for federal agencies to buy low carbon building materials and achieve net zero federal procurement by 2045. But there's talk of, you know, making that mandatory for across the board. So basically accelerating that transition, you know, to yeah. low carbon steel, low carbon cement, given that those are both, you know, heavy carbon intensive right. sectors. But yeah. there, there's it, obviously some things that Biden, the administration could do unilaterally. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of the situation we had in the, uh, the, the Trump era, uh, hopefully the one and only Trump era. Um, and, <laughs> and where it, it, it sort of forced the states to, instead of sitting back and waiting for the federal government to roll out investment tax credits and renewable energy standards and so forth, that the, 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 the emphasis came upon the states finally that, look, you know, we need to get off our butts and we need to make it happen because it's not going to happen at a federal level anymore. So, I think we're going to be pivoting back towards that again. And hopefully now that you know, the technology has advanced another few, four years or so since then, um, there are you know, even more opportunities that go above and beyond what we were looking at in terms of just renewable energy generation. And now we might be looking at standards regarding you know, battery integration into the grid or a certain number of fleet vehicles need to be electric by X date or whatever it might be. So there's a lot that can be done at a state level without having to rely on the federal government. Yeah, indeed. I mean, there's, I think that's the beauty of it. It, it, I suppose it, you know, the list gets so long, it could be overwhelming, but I think the, the positive in that, and John talked about this too, is just that there are a lot of levers we can pull. Speaking of, of what people can do though, and I know you mentioned this when you were in the interview with John, but you know, go check out that project uh, drawdown site. It's really cool. There's a lot of information on there. You know, if you're looking to educate yourself and it just, the way it has everything laid out is really awesome. It, and when I hear project drawdown, the, you know, the whistle in uh, good, bad, and the ugly, you know, it goes off in my head, you know, it's like, do you know, like draw, draw down, <laughs> draw. <laughs> I, I mean, I just appreciate that you're willing to, you know, keep a surprise at what's going on in your head. I, <laughs> But but in all, all these, seriousness, John, call me. You want some marketing stuff, you know? You want some some stuff that's yeah. out there on the on the edge? Call me, man. That that's a good segue, though. It's like you knew what I was going to highlight for what can we do this week, and we have two options that we wanted to call out, and there are obviously more, but the two for this week. First is as Todd already pitched, uh, head over to Project Drawdown's website, and yeah. Give yourself an opportunity to kind of geek out. If you're somebody who wants to really dig into the details, uh, you know they've they've got that in spades. There's another cool uh, area where you can call the Drawdown Neighborhood, where you can where they highlight you know climate heroes from different places across the country talking about the things that they're doing. So yeah, a lot of great video content and otherwise over on the website. We'll put links obviously with uh, the show notes here, but really just Google Project Drawdown. So for option two. We'd like to encourage all of you to get in touch with your state representatives, you know, send them a, an email, ping them on social media and tell them to, you know, prioritize climate action in, in current and upcoming, you know, legislative sessions. Those individual pings do make a difference. You know, they've got a lot of stuff on their plate and you want to ensure that they know that climate change is, is critical for their constituents. So I think uh, that's a wrap for this episode. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Come back on February 14th when we'll be focusing on another round of overpopulation and climate and how the two play together. Climate Optimist is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co and don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimist Podcast.